and welcome to the Equinix Metal YouTube, Twitch, and Periscope. My name is David Mackay. I am a developer advocate at Equinix Metal. Today, we're going to be talking about networking. We're going to be talking about level two, level three, BGP, and loads of other stuff that I wish I knew and understood. I am the kind of developer that has bought multiple Udemy courses on networking and completed none. However, I am fortunate enough to be joined by Stuart today, who is going to teach me everything in the world about networking and you too. Hey, Stuart, how's it going? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. How, how long have we got the stream? A few days? No pressure. No <laughs> pressure whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Just everything you know, please. In 30 yeah. minutes. That's it. <laughs> All right. Let, let's start with this is what a cable is. Go from there. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, just start with a little bit about yourself? Do you want us, you know, share us about who is Stuart? Yeah, so I am Stuart. I am a um, site reliability engineer for a cloud security company currently. And um, previously, I, up until a couple of years ago, I spent around a decade in the service provider networking industry. So, you know, dealing with Cisco's, dealing with um, all, all sorts of different kit, but also dealing with Linux and networking on that side as well. So, yeah, um, yeah, spent a lot of time on layer two, layer three, BGP, and yeah, everything that goes along with that as well. So, so you've, you've finished the Udemy courses then? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. On my last day of networking, that's when I did the last bit, yeah. <laughs> nice, awesome. Well, we've got a, a pretty cool agenda lined up for today. We're going to be hands-on playing with Bare Metal Equinix. We're going to be looking at the different networking options that are available and how to configure some of the cool VLAN, VXE, other... As a, as, that's all the acronyms I've got, by the way. That's the <laughs> um, we're going to take a look at all of that today. So you've had an opportunity over, I think it was the, the last week or two, to kind of kick the tires on Equinix Metal and play around with these options. You want to just kind of share with us what you found? Uh, yeah, so I suppose in a way, you come, you know, obviously Equinix Metal has the, um, you know, it's a bare metal networking provider, uh, sorry, bare metal server provider. And in the process, there's a lot of bare metal networking, which you don't often see in other cloud providers. You tend to just see a, um, you know, you've got an abstraction here, whereas, you know, in some senses, it almost feels like you're managing the network itself at this point. Um, and what I've noticed so far is, um, you know, everything starts with a bonded interface. Um, so that's where you have, rather than a single interface, you have multiple interfaces placed together so that it means that if one interface goes away, you can go go to the other one and carry on um, forwarding traffic. Um, otherwise, you know, if you've only got a single interface, something happens on that one, you lose everything. Um, ah, so that's what bonded means. It means there's multiple physical nicks yes, in the it, machine that provide resiliency and redundancy and events that something goes wrong. Yes, and that they will then present to, say it's um, a Linux um, server, they will prevent themselves as a single interface that you can then um, put IPs on or do other, other things. You know, if you want to get into the whole side of pro root and protocols, you can run them on the bonded interface. And then, you know, if you have a different interfaces and you're running root pro protocols over them if one disappears things have to move to the other one whereas in a bonded one it just knows that an interface has disappeared and starts sending traffic the other way instead nice so. we are not even five minutes then i am already <laughs> learning stuff for me so, uh, super excited about that okay so uh you logged in you we got a bonded interface i'm yep. assuming for some of the stuff today is we're probably going to have to unbond those interfaces to be able to do some of the the magic stuff it entirely depends we can do um so that there's a couple of sides there's the hybrid mode which means that you can do some magic with um the bonded or unbonded um or you can just do um what is classed as pure layer two which is literally um no ips assigned from equinix you supply your own at that point between servers uh, as well so yeah there's many different ways you could go about it and you know as in networking it's um yeah that there's not just one way of doing things and there never will be okay um well i mean i already have many questions but why don't we like share my screen kick it around the Take a look at the project that I've, I've kind of got set up and spin yep. up some metal and then I'm just going to throw loads more questions at you yep. as we begin to play with things. So. Sounds good to me. Uh, all right, so let's see. Screen share. Let's pop us down there. This is a empty project. I don't think there is anything going on here. So in order for... Let me just do in that actually a little bit. 
So in order for us to get started, uh, well, <laughs> maybe we should decide what we're doing first. Should I spin yep. up a device or do we need to do something on the networking aspect of the project first? So it entirely depends. Are we, are we looking to involve BGP at any point? Um, because that needs enabling on the project. Otherwise, we can, for now, just spin up um, a server or two and just do networking between them. So depends what we're starting with, I guess. Yeah, well, why don't we just enable it so that it's there? And then if we use it, we use it. If we don't use it, we don't use it. Yeah. Um, okay, so actually, it looks like it's already enabled. Um, so I probably enabled that on this project in the past. Yeah. Uh, why don't we spin up a new one then? There we go. And BGP. There we go. So on a fresh project, you won't have it enabled, but it is literally a click of a button. Um, now there's two different deployment types here. There's local BGP and global BGP. Um, yep. I think I know what these are, but I'm happy for you to give us the 30 second pitch if you want. <laughs> yep, that's fine. So um, BGP is technically the way the internet works in terms of routing. So if you want to get from one machine to another the other side of the world, BGP is involved in doing that. It's essentially the backbone of the internet. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use it for other things. So you can um, create a server and have another server and put BGP between them. And that's how they um, advertise routes to each other. There's nothing to say it has to advertise out beyond that and out into the global internet. Um, and in this case, we have a local BGP. The idea with that is you can advertise routes into um, Equinix at this point. So say we've chosen a IP that's from Equinix. Um, so there's an elastic IP concept where you know it's an IP that is owned by Equinix. You can then say this server um, will advertise this to Equinix. Now, that's an Equinix owned IP. A lot of um, companies, um, some of the larger ones, even some of the smaller ones, have their own what's called IP space, which means that they can have multiple providers that they advertise their space to, and it means that they've got redundancy. Global BGP is essentially that where you own your own IP space and you are saying this um, IP space, I would like to advertise some of it to you um, rather than saying I will advertise an Equinix IP to Equinix. This is my IP to Equinix. So it just means that, you know, a good example of using this is something like um, Anycast. You can potentially advertise that in many different places and have that um, globally available. And then, you know, it could be Equinix. It could be another provider you advertise that to. And then if one disappears, um, it will go to a different provider, but you are using the same IP space. And again, that's the whole global BGP concept. It's your IP space that's advertised to Equinix rather than Equinix's own IP space. Nice. And while you were going through that wonderful description of BGP, I managed to reload into a different browser so the screen sharing worked. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was a really good explanation. Um, and the Anycast stuff, I think, is, is really, really cool um, from a global BGP perspective because you can build your own CDN and deliver low latency services to anyone anywhere in the world. Exactly, really, really yes. Cool. All right, let's click Add. Um, you do have the ability to set a password on this, but we're not going to be doing that for today, so we can just hit the Add button, and we now have BGP available on our project. Okay, so... You said there was a couple of things we could do. Um, you mentioned that there is L2 and L3 options. Yeah. Um, so L2 being when we describe our own network, our own subnets, our own sliders, and L3 being where we use what is allocated to us by Equinix Metals. Uh, is that close? No? Not quite, no. <laughs> uh, so layer two is... In a sense, it's um, if you see an IP subnet, so let's take one 192.168.1.0 um, and you have an IP 192.168.1.1 and another computer has 192.168.1.2. For them to communicate with each other, they've got to be in what's called the same broadcast domain 
um, which is um, effectively just sort of like a path between them on. So if you plugged into a switch, it would be one one in one, sorry, one cable into one port on the switch, one cable into another port on the switch. As long as no one's changed the config of that switch by default, they're usually um, all, all in the same layer two segment. And effectively, it's a segment where um, stuff can communicate within the same um, subnet. Now, layer three would be the case of if you had a computer that was in 192.168.1.1, and then you want to communicate with 192.168.2.1, layer three is the communication between them two. So at that point, you would route between them. So essentially, layer two is the forwarding. So it involves no real um, push between, uh, <laughs> sorry, a, in a single path. Whereas layer three, you need something called a router to say, I know where things in this subnet are, I know where things in this subnet are, you need to come to me to get to them. By default, most computers um, don't have the ability to do routing um, to another subnet without a router in place to do so. Okay, awesome. That's also fixed a few things in my in my mind that we're, well, blatantly wrong. <laughs> so uh, we have a question, which I think you maybe just answered it, but I'll pop it up anyway. Uh, Atty Chris is asking, is there a difference between L2 and like the standard subnet? Yes. Um, I mean, this is one of them where the answer, if you get very complex, yes, potentially. <laughs> Traditionally, no. What you tend to have is one subnet per layer two segment at that point. So everything that would be, as I say again, 192.168.1.0 um, slash 24, everything that's in that subnet is usually in the same layer two domain. Now, there's many things that can change that. There's things like um, something called PPPoE, which is how um, mm -hmm. things like uh, ADSL and home broadband works. That is just throws that concept completely out the window. But in most standard networks with switching and routing and that kind of thing, a standard subnet is um, everything in it is usually in the same layer two domain at that point. Okay, that helps definitely. Okay, you mentioned one other thing uh, so far that kind of flew right over my head, but the, the concept then of a hybrid network. Yeah, so in terms of hybrid, it's, it's an Equinix term. However, I've seen it used elsewhere. Um, and what that means in um, Equinix's world is a interface which can have both a layer three IP. Um, so let's say, again, we're going back to 192.168, a 192.168.1.1 IP on the base bond zero interface. And then you can also add something called a VLAN on top of it, which is essentially where I was talking about, you know, a single switch uh, most things that you connect to it would be in the same layer two domain. A VLAN is where you separate that. So you would say, this one is in this layer two domain, this is in this layer two domain without necessarily needing you switch to do so. Um, and yeah, in this case, the uh, the hybrid means adding VLANs onto it at that point. Okay. Uh, we got one more question from chat, so I'm going to pop that on and then we'll move on with the hands-on segment. So Omar is asking, is L2 within a rack or a data center? Um, again, entirely depend on <laughs> network architecture. Um, it's, you know, you could um, expand your layer two domain potentially around the world, or you could have it only in a single switch and between two servers. It's entirely up to you. How you break that up is usually with either VLANs or with routers. Those are the parts that usually break up layer two. Um, there's something called VXLANs, which kind of takes that concept and takes it a little bit further. Um, but yeah, traditionally, what you mean by layer two is, yeah, it could be anywhere. Um, but realistically, you tend to keep it either within a rack, within a data center. Um, a few years ago, probably you know, close to about a decade ago, layer two started to be expanded between data centers. And that was because things like ESXi had um, vMotion and that could only exist within a layer two domain. So you couldn't do it uh -huh. across VLANs. You couldn't do it across routed boundaries. So you had to have that layer two stretched across the set. Um, to data centers if you wanted your VMs to move. And they, you know, they they fixed that later on. As far as I know, they went to layer three vMotion at one point. But yeah, the initial side was, yeah, stretch it as far as you can. All right. So you threw in a VXLAN there. Is that just extended VLANs? 
It, yes, mostly. So one of the limitations of VLANs, sorry, I should have taken a drink, drink for that, um, <laughs> is... It's my that... fault. I'm the one who's making you just sit here and like <laughs> drop all of your brain out verbally. So. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so VLANs are great. They are, as I said, they are able to segment layer two domains, and it means that then to get between them, you usually need a router or something of similar nature. The problem with VLANs is they only go up to a highest ID of 4,094, which is fine in most cases, but you may reach a limitation where you just go, I've run out of them. Um, you know, In places that worked before, we would go for a VLAN per site that we um, deployed to, at which point, if the moment we get to the 4,095, we have a problem because we're now reusing VLANs and we didn't want to do that. In some cases, it's just more of an arbitrary. We don't want to use the same VLAN because it's, you know, our identifier for site. For some places, they literally have overlaps and can't have that many um, VLANs. Now, VXLANs are an extension of that. So rather than having 4,094, it's somewhere in the, I think it's around 60 million IDs that you can choose from, um, at which point, you know, obviously, there's a lot more of that um, available. And one of the limitations of layer two networking um, is that there's a concept of loop prevention. So if you plug a switch back into itself um, without any additional protocols, a packet may go through the switch, go back out that cable and go back into it and then just keep doing it over and over and over and over until the basically switch heats up to the point that the fans die um, and then you've lost everything. There's protocols that take care of that, but they're very, they, they, they don't, how to describe this, they're very traditional. They're not modern in the, in the way they go about things. And you don't get to take advantage of as much redundancy as you'd like to. You know, things like bonded interfaces are fine. Um, but if you can't use them or, you know, you're going to dip multiple different switches, you can't do bonded interfaces in that sense, at which point there's a problem. What VXLANs do is they essentially sit on top of layer three, so you can route um, essentially layer two traffic at that point, which you usually can't. And it means that now your loop prevention on your way of getting between places is all based on layer three, which um, traditionally is a lot more resilient and you can um, put a lot more better ways of spreading bandwidth as well. So, yeah. Cool. Lots of knowledge there. Um, let's click on this L2 part of the project. So yes, should we add a VLAN for today's session? I'm assuming we're going to spin up a couple of devices. Um, uh, I guess. I would, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say we get, we get one going, and then we can show you know how to configure a VLAN and what a VLAN is, and then yeah, see how it's slightly different from just the base interface you get at that point. So yeah, makes sense. All right, so I'm going to create a VLAN in our AM Metro, and give it a description. Oh, this oh, there's already Rockwood live stream. There we go. Okay, so I get a VLAN ID of one thousand. I have zero devices. That's it. Yeah. For now, so that's, that's not that's, really done anything, right? And yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that is so we can use it with the um devices that we're going to spin up. So right now this is just a almost a placeholder and then we'll make use of it soon. So is, is this talking to like a top of rec switch already to let it know that I need a VLAN or is it really just a superficial, you have a VLAN right now? So in, uh, the, <laughs> it's, it's the most famous answer in the world. It depends. It depends. Um, <laughs> I would suggest that it's probably configuring something ready to then configure the actual ports that we're going to bring up. So that VLAN now probably exists somewhere. It's just then where we then configure it beyond that. So I, know. I love how you, you don't even work for Equinix Metal or know what's going on behind the scenes, and I'm sitting here <laughs> asking you the question. So, uh, let's spin up some servers then. So let's spin up a couple of on-demands. Uh, I just need to remember to put them in Amsterdam. Oh, we've got more questions too. Let me click spin up on this first. Uh, I'll just grab my go to C3 medium devices. Does the operating system matter at all to you? Um, Debian 10 is probably easier to deal with um, just in terms of how to show how to configure VLANs. Um, I've not quite um, got it in my head with how to do it with NetPlan yet. 
I'll, you know, it's you know just a bit easy with um, traditional Debian at this point. All right, and um, is two servers enough for what we want to show? Do you think we should spin up a couple more? Wait, wait. Uh, two would work for now. We can easily add more afterwards. <laughs> so, all right. Do we want to change the allocated IP addresses? Um, I think we'll be fine with what we've got for now. Um, yeah, so just I'll click just the big blue button then. Right. Yeah, okay. let's go with that and then you figure it after. <laughs> All right, let's see what questions we have here. So, Hack the Gibson, awesome username. Uh, with bonded interfaces, do you essentially get double the possible throughput, or are they just used as a resiliency redundancy or, or failover, as I've said, uh, in case one of the physical links fails? So, I'm going to use the yes and no um, answer <laughs> again on this. I keep doing this, but yeah, there's, there's so many different facets of networking on this, but you can potentially get double the bandwidth. However, a single stream of traffic will only ever go across one interface. So if you're only doing a single source application and source port to a single destination port and destination IP address, you will only ever use one um, interface. However, if you then have another stream, it could potentially go to the second interface. There's no guarantees. It's basically, it's a hashing algorithm of the um, source, destination IP, source and destination port. Um, and it just, you know, it will choose based upon, you know, whether, you know, if there's two interfaces, it'll go, you know, it was even or odd and I'll choose them. If there's three interfaces, it, you know, does something like a modular on three and finds out which one to go to, that kind of stuff. But if you have a server or servers which process a lot of traffic and process a lot of different networking connections, yes, you will get use of both interfaces. If you're only ever going from one, um, going from one source to one destination, you don't get the benefit of bonded interfaces. You get the failover, you don't get the bandwidth. Okay. It sounds like, you know, the same decisions we have to make with disks. I don't know if this is just my really naive understanding, but if I have multiple disks, I can decide which RAID setup I want with them. I guess the same applies to the network cards. Like I could, would you bond more than two or would you only ever bond two? Uh, you, it's um, it's dependent on the OS and dependent on the network card. Usually, you can bond a lot more than that. Um, uh, there's a limitation on certain switches where they will go up to a maximum of eight. Um, usually, um, but yeah, I'm I'm not sure if the limitations still exist on them ones because I've not been managing for a couple of years now. But yeah, um, you know, as okay. as many interfaces got available, you can use them. Kind of thing. So let's flip that question from Hack the Gibson round a little bit then. If my you know my goal is is just performance and throughput, yep. is that where you would say okay, run them unbonded to separate NICs and route traffic accordingly from the applications, or would bonded still be the right approach? So, uh, are you going to tell me it depends again? I, I uh, exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do. So if you can. Um, if you know that you've got a certain application that's, um, you know, you're talking to two different servers um, at all times, you could say this server you route this way, this server you route that way. However, you've also got to think about the return path of traffic as well as so you'd have to say. Yeah. To return from here, you've got to go this way, return here from this way, you've got to go this way. Bonded is usually the easiest way to go about it. However, with things like routing protocols, um, you know, we're going to, we're possibly going to get into BGP, but even things like there's, um, another one would be OSPF. There's, um, ISIS is another one rip if, you know, not many people use it nowadays, but you now it's an option and they have something called equal cost multipath. And what they will say is if my way of getting to the destination is the same across both of these paths, I will send traffic down both of these paths. However, if there's, you know, one slightly preferred over the other, you'll only ever get um, down one. So, again, unfortunately, as in networking, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, that was good discussion because we now have two devices that we can SSH onto. So let's grab the IP address of this first one. And put on a route. And I'm in. All right, cool. so here's what we have. Uh, yeah. We have a bonded interface here. Yep. Configured with our private IPv4, IPv4 subnet, our public IPv4 subnet, and then two IPv6 subnets. Yes. I guess this is all 
nice and standard pretty much right for the most part yes um you know sometimes you'll just have a single ip on sometimes you'll have a single ipv4 and ipv6 um but yeah it's uh, there's no limitation in terms of how many ips you could have on this kind of interface anyway so yeah um what you'll also notice there is the two interfaces above it the emp65 s o f o and f1 you'll see that they have a master bond zero that means that bond zero is now aggregating traffic across both of these interfaces. So that's what that part means. Yeah. What was wrong with ETH zero and ETH one? I miss the simpler <laughs> days where I just knew what the device was going to be called on the kernel. These days I have no idea what to expect. Yes, I, I yeah. think they call it predictable naming and yet it's the most unpredictable naming I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. So, so yes. Okay, so we've got our two devices, we created a VLAN, we're not doing anything with that VLAN yet. Yes. Should we then configure one of our machines here to speak VLAN? So the, yes, so <laughs> I guess the first thing we probably need to do is actually attach the VLAN to the devices. We've not done that side yet. So okay, if you go back into the conch. VLAN to the <laughs> no, 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 work. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, if you go into the server and then it's in network, I believe you can attach the VLAN from there. Um, let's have a look. Where is it within the VLAN? Um, so I guess we need to convert it to because currently it's, yes, it's on the body to L3 interface, so we're going to want to yeah. convert it, right? Yes, we want to take that to um, the hybrid mode there, which allows us to have the existing layer three IPs on there. So the public IP we saw the IPv6, but now can also add a VLAN to it as well if we change to hybrid. Okay. So L3 is the default. I yep. work with Equinix Metals networking. Hybrid is what we're going to play with where we actually run on both our VLAN network and the Equinix Metal network. And yep. then there's the L2 where I just completely disregard whatever Equinix Metal threw at me and do my own thing. Exactly, yes. Okay. Well, that one sounds scary. Maybe that's for another day. So yeah. let's go with the hybrid. Now we have the ability to continue to run on a bonded interface or run unbonded. What should I what what should I be thinking about here when I'm making this decision? So I suppose what you need to think about mainly is the unbonded modes are splitting the interfaces separately. So rather than as we were talking about having two interfaces that there's resilience and you know one disappears, you've still got the other one. Unbonded means that you've got a interface which has all your IP details on there that we've already got. So the public IP, the management IP, then the other interface has nothing on it. Um, which means that potentially if you are aiming for resilience, it's not the way to go. However, if you are building any cast nodes and you have, want multiple of them, you could potentially do this to have, uh, you know, just multiple servers being your resilience point rather than multiple cables and multiple interfaces being your um, resilience at that point. I mean, I would tend to choose bonded in this scenario, but yeah, it's it's fine either way. Yeah, is there uh, as a kind of a tough question? Is, is there any like scenarios or use cases where you would say immediately, yes, you definitely want to go unbonded? Like, is using the network as a boundary a reason to go by unbonded or not? Um, I would say what you're more looking at in terms of you know it, it's more how you think logically about it. Do you want to say? This interface, I will always think about this as my public interface. This interface, I'll always think about my as my internal interface, rather than these VLANs will be the way of doing it. And yes, you can attach VLANs to the unbonded interface um, at that point, um, but it also means you could um, always have a public interface and always have a pure layer two interface if you want to view it that way. It's, it's again, it's another, I hate to say it, it's another, it depends. <laughs> But it, it's entirely down to how you view your infrastructure. Do you want, let um, you know, the server to be the separation, or do you just want the server to be able to route between VLANs and that kind of thing? So again, it depends. Awesome, thank you for that. So we now have our bonded configuration now talking to our one thousand VLAN. Yeah. So is, that, is this machine now is this... part of that network? Yes, so this machine now has, we've still got the existing IPs on there. We'll still be able to reach it with the public and potentially the private IP if we were internal to the network. 
but we've now also got an additional VLAN on there. It's not configured yet, but we can make use of it soon. So the only thing now we really need to do is do it to the other server as well so that we can start doing some communication between the two over the VLAN. All right, we can fly through that. So we're just going to do bonded, pick the VLAN that we created and hit go. All right, perfect. Uh, so do we want to... Uh, do we need to do anything else on the Equinix console right now, or are we jumping back over to my terminal on machine number one? We will be going back to the terminal now. Nice. Okay. So because everything we've done so far is just through the portal, Equinix Metal does not have the ability to modify anything on my machine, nothing has actually changed from this perspective, correct? Exactly, yes. Okay. So what we can now do is enable the server's ability to speak VLANs. Technically, you can do it as it is, but there's a helper application just called VLAN that makes it so it's a lot easier to work with them. So if you just do um, uh, just do an apt install VLAN and... Um, ah, yep, yeah, sorry, update first, <laughs> as always. And then, yeah, if you just apt install VLAN. Now, what this means from now on, can't do the VLAN stuff directly, but it means that we can now start configuring VLANs through things like the interfaces file. Without that, you've got to essentially do VLANs manually with um, IP root to command. So yeah, IP link add such and such VLAN ID, and then they're not persistent on a reboot. So adding this means that essentially we've just got a helper that allows the interfaces file to define VLANs instead. Okay, nice. Um, now, the only other thing we need to do is if you do a mod probe, and then you want 8021Q. That's it. And if we also do an echo 8021Q and just um, append it to etc slash modules, uh, you want to... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I realized exactly what I had done there. Um, I'm going to jump onto that other machine. Yeah, there. I think from memory, the only other thing in there is Bond, but yeah, we'll have a look. <laughs> because in my head, I was like, I should really put this into modules.d and do this the nicer way. And I was like, okay, it doesn't yeah. really matter. And then I noticed the uh, bonding. Yeah, that's the only other one. And uh, was it the same? I'll just stick to them, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was 8021Q. So what is the 8021Q yep. kernel module? Yes. So 8021Q refers to um, the, I think it's IEEE, um, who are a network standards body who basically create, you know, standards for networking. So, you know, whether you, you, know, you have standards for other things in the industry, IEEE and the IETF are two, um, kind of foundations that say, this is how we're going to do VLANs um, as a standard. This is how we're going to do a certain protocol as a standard, such and such, that kind of thing. Um, 802.1Q is VLANs the standard. So that is the standard within the IEEE um, for how to define VLANs. Um, there's a big RFC for it. If you go and read all that, you'll understand every single iota of how a VLAN works. But in, in short, 802.1Q is the protocol for VLANs. I don't need an RFC. I've got sure. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, you mentioned earlier that we're going to have to start adding an interface. Is that our, our next step? Yes. So if you just go to um, net, the ETC network and interfaces file, um, so we can already see that we've got the bond zero interface. And then mm -hmm. if you go to the very bottom, we've probably also got a bond. Yes, so we've got the bond zero, colon zero. That's an alias. Now to add a VLAN, rather than using a colon, you use a dot. Um, and that's it in um, Debian land. So if you do auto bond zero and then dot, dot 1000. And then again, yep, bond zero, dot 1000. And then all we need to do after this one for now is let's just put addresses, I don't know, 192.168.13.1. And then if you do, you can do use a slash notation here, but net, net mask is fine. And just do 255.255.255.0. And that's it. Um, OK. 
Okay, so that net mass means that we're using a slash 24 network yes. for this VLAN. Yes. Which means we can use anything after dot 13 all the way from 2 to 255. Uh, two, five, four. Everything from one to two five four, yes. Yeah. Two five five is what's called the broadcast address. So, yeah, at that point when they need to do things like, oh, let me think of a good one for broadcast. Um, ARP is a good example that uses yeah. broadcast, but things like that. I knew that one. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so we can just save this, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So, is it? Would you say? Let me have it. I don't have to phrase this question. If you were going to be spinning up, say, a dozen Equinix metal machines and you wanted your own VLAN, would yeah. you go running your own DHCP server on this machine to allocate addresses to other machines, or would you do them all as static IP? Um, it's, <laughs> I'm it going to say it again, it entirely <laughs> depends. Yeah. So if the aim of what you're trying to do is to say, I don't know, bring up multiple VPN gateways or something like that. Um, you would probably want a static IP because VPN gateways usually don't want that to change at some point. Yeah. However, if it's just a client that's going to come up, um, I don't know, like you know, Pixie testing or you know something that's TFTP or something similar to that, you a DHCP server would be absolutely fine to use on that as well. Um, the only issue you might find is in this mode, a server coming up would still need that interface there, and then you change it to INET DHCP. Um, there is another mode that we can cover um, either later or another time on how to deal with um, what's called un, uh, sorry native VLANs, which is where the BUN0 interface would actually by default be in VLAN 1000 rather than being just the BUN0 interface in Equinix's network. So at that point, DHCP makes a lot more sense because it can just pick up from here, for example. Nice. Okay, so do we need to bring that interface up? Yep. So, um, I mean, I know it's not the, yeah, I was going to say it's not, uh, it's not the preferred method to do it anymore, but that I never remember the IP link. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't remember ever yeah. is, is my go-to. Okay. Yeah. It, it works. Yeah. And... So let's have a look at that from here. Then we can see that we have our VLAN here. We have our IP address. Does that mean I can ping myself in this IP address now? Yeah, you should be able to, yep. And there you go. I'm VLANing already. Perfect. Yeah. So right now we won't be able to get to anything else because there's nothing else in that VLAN with an IP. But um, now we can start configuring the second server at this point. And yes, yeah. we've got the route to the subnet there. Yeah, and that's exactly kind of what I had in my head. So I'm, I'm glad I kind of looked at that. So that's just saying, root it through the bonded VLAN. Interface. Exactly, yes. I'm assuming we just repeat that all on machine number two and bump up the one to two. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to do it as 254, up to you. But um, yeah, that should be it. Have we installed the VLAN package on here? No. I know we put the modules in, but yeah. But what's the VLAN package doing? It, it's if you try to configure a VLAN in the interfaces file without it, um, it doesn't work because behind the scenes, Debian is relying on this VLAN package there to be able to configure it. If you instead, so we've got these post up, root, and down on the interfaces above, you could then use something like IP link add dev something or other VLAN ID and do it that way. But it's just not as nice syntax to use at that point. Whereas, you know, in this case, if you have that package installed, we can do it in this format and it will work. So as I say, it's literally a helper at that point. Learn it. Uh, device up IP think base. Don't know why I bother. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, does that mean I can now ping? We should hope so, yes. Oh, there we yeah. go. That's awesome. So, we have created a VLAN through the web interface, added a bonded VLAN to our devices, and now we are able to use our new private network across yeah. Equinix Metal. Yeah. Very, um, very cool. 
I mean, I suppose we could also prove it by doing something like SSH cross and taking down the public interface on the second server. We'd still be on via the VLAN. So that's one way of proving it. But yeah, this basically is now we've got communication between the two over this VLAN that only these devices are currently in. You know, there won't be anything I mean, else in I, You're telling me if I just run and let that ping go, and if I do a if down bond zero zero, uh, no. So what we'd need to do first is ensure SSH across that link first. So if you do that, I mean, I suppose technically you could, you could do it from here and then jump back to the other one and then SSH into it. And yeah, you won't have internet uh, yeah, connectivity. The, the problem being, like, yeah, I'm going to drop my own SSH connection and I'll be able to yeah. bring the interface back up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's not do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, so is there anything else we should show? With this side of things? Um, I mean, that kind of shows how VLANs work, how the bonded interfaces work. I suppose the other, it depends which way we want to go. Do we want to go in essentially making the uh, second server behind the first one? So it means that you can't get to it without reaching the first one. And that would probably be the layer two mode. Or um, we could just um, turn it into the unbonded modes and then start seeing, yes, we've got a single interface with this on, a single interface with these VLANs. So tell it to you which one you want to show. Hmm. So that would involve me knowing the passwords of the root user and the device because my keys, well, I could proxy my key, couldn't I? Only if I got it right. <laughs> uh, seems risky, but mm. why not? Uh, yeah, let's try this then, and uh, we can take a quick look. Uh, everything we've done so far has been very manual, just so that we could walk through and kind of show all of the steps. But you you have also prepared um, some automation using Pulumi yes. that anyone that is watching can definitely check out in their own time. Uh, and depending on how we do for time here, we may take a quick look at a few of those steps. Yeah. Okay, so you gave me two options there. Why don't we... Let me make sure I can do password-based SSH first. Although that's going to flash the password to everybody. And not that I don't trust you all, but I don't. <laughs> Let me pull the passwords up on a, another browser. And I, I what believe I'll do... you can't from my testing, but we'll soon find out. <laughs> <laughs> is... Well, uh, uh, well, how do I disable the SSH agent? <laughs> Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, try dash VVV. Why does it not let me do password? Well, I think it's just configured that way. Okay. So the password's only going to work over the CDL SSH console, of course. Yes. Should have known that, to be fair. All right, let's. Do the bad thing. <laughs> Logan. Uh, passwords. Yes. Or SSH. Cool. Ah. All right. And copy. Okay, so what we want to try now is I'll just go back in over my key uh, and I'm going to try uh, passwording over that new VLAN. Yep. There we are. Awesome. So, shall we destroy some interfaces? Why not? Let's <laughs> turn. Let's think which way is going to be the easiest. Uh, let's, do, let's do it from the machine itself rather than change anything in the Equinix side because I don't I don't know for certain whether it's going to start removing VLANs and stuff like that. So we're probably better off doing it manually from here. So Yeah, well, you know, something I am very familiar with doing is breaking this file completely. <laughs> so uh, we still want bond zero, but we yep. can probably get away with removing bond zero zero, right? Uh, yes. Confident? Yep. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. And restarting... Network. It's a networking networking. I can never remember. 
think it's networking, but I could be wrong. Yep, and that, oh, no. Ah, now the problem there is it doesn't always, <laughs> yeah, it's not removed it. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a little bit. I suppose we did only remove the management IP there from what I remember. Uh, yes, so actually it has done that, but it's only removed the management side. So that was the alias on top of the bond zero. So I suppose what we want to do here uh -huh. is if you get rid of just gateway for now, we'll do it. So we can keep the IP addresses there, but the gateway is how this routes um, beyond Equinix, beyond the local subnet. So if you got rid of that, it now wouldn't be able to route publicly at all. Okay, I think I have no lost that connection. Yes. <laughs> but this one. we are still by <laughs> the other one. So I suppose if we just have a look at the routing table, just see if it's missing its default route, it's probably the... Yep, so no default route at all. So this now cannot access the internet at all. Um, yep, however, that's... we can still get get to it over the VLAN at this point. I guess this is quite a common pattern where people want to have Bastion hosts that provide access in a nice, secure fashion to their infrastructure. Exactly. So whether you do that with VLANs, whether you do it another method entirely, but yes, it's something like this. And then because you can have multiple VLANs, you could also set this up as a uh, almost like a firewall at that point. So you can't route between these VLANs um, or you can only route this traffic between these VLANs and almost, you know, create your own bare metal Linux-based firewall or something at that point as well. Okay, so I'm going to throw something random out and you can tell me to, to shut up if you want. But <laughs> if we were to come into the networking on uh, device one yeah, uh, and change that to be pure L2 now... Yes. That... Is that the same situation that we're in by removing that gateway in a weird way? Uh, potentially, yes. However, we may need to use the serial console to get back in. I've got a feeling this removes existing interfaces to do so. So, uh, Well, it yes. can't modify anything on the disk. Hmm, intriguing. Should we do it? I mean, we're almost done anyway, so we can just we can yeah. break a few things, right? Okay. Yeah, let's give it a shot, see what happens. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't think we're going to lose our interface here just because Equinix Metal cannot touch anything on your disk. Once it's provisioned to you, that is it. Um, yep. The only network stamps we do are through provisioning through an in-memory OS, which you can also do by switching to rescue mode as well. But yes. that can't happen here. So in theory, that connection is safe. What, and the reason I wanted to do this is I'm curious now is that we've moved into L2 mode. We only have our VLAN. It's how do I get this machine to speak to the internet? Can I? Uh, yes, probably via the second machine at this point. So, <laughs> um, so on its own right now, no, it's completely isolated. Um, what we could do is provide a default gateway for this machine, but the default gateway is now 192.168.13.1. So if we go into the interfaces file again on this machine. Um, can I just delete this bond zero? Uh, I'd I leave that bit. It. Yeah, if you delete that, also the in, the other interface would go as well. The bond zero dot one thousand because it's a sub interface of such. But if you just put gateway at the end of this, and then it's one nine two one six eight thirteen dot one two eight, and then. Hopefully, an if up on that one will then also do the route, as it does from what I remember. Uh, yeah, no, maybe not. Uh, well, am I going to have to restart networking? Maybe. Just because it yes. says it's already down. Yeah. It's a bit scary at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> this is where everything goes, and it proves me, me wrong the entire time. <laughs> oh, well. It's all good. Yeah, that's what I get for. Oh no! Look at that. Let's have a look. Do we have a gateway? Ah, we do. Yes. So we now have default. Now, right now, that still won't work ah. because the other machine needs to be put into um, be able to route traffic, 
And then also it needs a firewall rule on there. Well, a, a NAT rule to say anything that comes into this with a private IP. So that's our 192.168.13 uh, um, range. We need that to be translated into a public IP so that the rest of the internet just sees it as us at this point. Um, without that, it will try to still source traffic from 192.168.13.1 and everything on the internet will just go, that's not valid on the public internet and just drop it. So, okay. So we have to add a NAT thingy, Majiggy. Yes. So if you just do IP tables, and again, not the fashionable way anymore, but so be it. Uh, minus T and uh, NAT in lowercase, and then you want to do minus A, um, uppercase. Sorry for A, and then you want in uppercase post routing. Sorry, or, or yeah, post routing. You want to put minus s, uh, s. Sorry, not f. Um, and then just zero dot zero dot zero dot zero slash zero. And then you want minus j. Um, and you want the word in uppercase masquerade. Uh, it's a u e. And then the last one is minus O bond zero. So. And you just had that set at the top of your head? Yes, I've done <laughs> enough with IP tables for. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's take a look at that. Uh, you want to do minus T on, on um, that command as well, so it shows it for the NAT table. Uh, minus T uh, Nat, sorry. Um, uh, and there you go. We now have that masquerade all there. Now, this still doesn't do everything because we need to enable routing within Linux. So Linux, by default, doesn't allow traffic to be forwarded through it. It will allow traffic to, for this as a destination, for this as a source, it doesn't go through. So what we need to do now is if you go into etc and sysctl.conf. And then if you just go down a little bit, there is, yeah, exactly that. Net RPV forward. And that, if we go to the other machine, if I've got this right. I'll just do it this way. Ah, yes. Yeah, of course. Um, this is what I'm trying to remember. I think it's... What was it called? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah. I think if you do sysctl minus p, it already enables that. Um, and then, yeah, just try that. Yeah, yep, that enables it as part of that. Um, now, if I've got this right, this should now, from the other machine, now be able to ping out to whatever, uh, ping to Google or something. Oh, let me just grab that password again. And Google. Is... Ah, we haven't done any IPv6. Do a ping minus four on this one to make sure it's just IPv4 for now. And there you go. We're now out to the internet. Ah. Now that is impressive, sure. Uh, in fact, you're impressing the chat too. <laughs> <laughs> IP tables without Googling, definitely. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a rule I've had to do more than once, put it that way. So, Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for kind of guiding me through that and sharing all of that knowledge uh, and process. Let's uh, take a look at your automation, and then we'll wrap up in just a few minutes, and uh, I'll let you get back to your day. <laughs> Sounds good so, to me. Uh, let's see. You have a link, which I'll just pop on screen, is gitlab.com slash juice. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that. Stu H84. That's the 84. one, yeah. <laughs> Stu H84, yeah. It's just first name, last name here. I was born. Yep. So. A little bit Equinix Metal. So let me just copy that too. You've been playing with Palumi a lot lately, right? You're a big yes. fan there. Yes, I am. Um... Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be using Terraform again soon, and I'm thinking I might just try and see if I can push more Palumi where I, where I go into. I'm starting to really enjoy it, to say the least. A great plan. Yeah. All right, so Lucy, you've got a few examples. Wow, cool. You've got an Anycast BGP example. We've got a basic bonded, basic hybrid bonded, 
body cloud and a, and a hybrid body cloud. So quite yes. a few examples there for people to play with and a little bit of a description too. Yeah, uh, let's just pick one to take a quick look at. Which one? What's your favorite? Um, I mean, my favorite's the Anycast BGP one, but there's quite a lot going on in that one, so it depends. Yeah, we can look at that one first if you want, or if we're going to do something that's a bit more basic. Um, yeah, obviously there's basic hybrid bonded, which is similar to what we've just done. Um, there's yeah, no cloud used, in it in this one. You used Go as well. Yeah, it, it's fast becoming my favorite language to use for everything, <laughs> even when it shouldn't be. And, you know, sometimes pulling me, it's a little harder with Go, but yeah, I'm enjoying so, it. If there's no cloud in it, I'm assuming this still requires the manual steps on the server side. Yes, exactly. So that would spin it all up. Whereas if we went to, yeah, the hybrid cloud in it one, um, that one does essentially what we just did at this point so we are yeah if you're using the juju cloud in a package that's a great yeah. package big fan of that one yeah, uh, so so that, yeah i was i was initially doing it all with standard yaml and now it's just yeah <laughs> this way instead this is exactly what we did almost that's awesome pretty much yes and yeah i mean it, it's not doing anything beyond that it's not you know installing the packages like nginx but yeah it gets us to basically where we are now and this is the Pulumi code to actually provision the VLAN instead of doing that through the console. Uh, and then is there an attach? Yeah, there we go. The new device network type here. Yes. So all readily automatable using Terraform, Pulumi, and a whole bunch of other tooling, or just a straight API. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks for doing those examples. That's really cool as well. No worries. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm not going to go through. I, I would love to go through the BGP example. I'm a big fan of Anycast BGP, but yeah. you know we are approaching the hour. Uh, we're both in the UK, which means it's rather late. So <laughs> uh, I will just finish this by saying thank you very much. It was really insightful. I learned an absolute ton doing that. I hope the repositories are useful to the people watching at home, and hopefully just the manual process of going through that uh, helps everyone understand it as well. Yes. No, it, it, it's nice to be able to put something out that's like there. And um, yeah, all, all them 10 years of have been in this network <laughs> industry is now finally um, where, you know, finally come to fruition. All right. Well, you have a great evening, Stuart. Thank you again for joining me. And I'll speak to you again soon. Have a great day. Brilliant. Thank you.